Okay, well we are at uh, 1230 Eastern, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is John Mann, and I'm an assistant professor here at Michigan State University, and I host this series, Innovations in Agriculture and Rural Development, and it's sponsored by the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. So first off, I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar on uh, agriculture. So the title is uh, Cosa Java Oil, a promoter of growth and stress tolerance for aquaculture species. Before we uh, start the presentation, I want to point out a few items. So if you haven't done so, please take a moment and uh, fill out our poll questions. Um, your feedback is helpful for us. And uh, we'll have a couple more questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Um, in the uh, chat box below, so I put uh, Jake's and my email. So if you've got questions about this or other webinars, uh, please email me. If you've got a question uh, specifically about this email or this uh, webinar, please email Jake. I've also included my LinkedIn information, so I like to connect with uh, my network there, and also our YouTube page. So um, I've gotten about uh, 15 to 20 emails from folks who are not able to participate today, but this will be where the webinar will be posted, um, and so I should have that up in the next uh, day or so. Um, so we are, in, we are recording this. Um, finally, uh, the presentation itself is going to be about 25 minutes. Um, 20 to 25 minutes and we'll have about 10 to 20 minutes for questions and answers so as your questions come up please enter them in the chat box below um, and last I want to thank everybody for uh, participating today so our presenter is uh, Dr. Jake Olson he's a researcher and technology developer at the University of Wisconsin's aquaculture lab his uh, primary research interests involve nutrition, immunology, animal science, and the practical applications of science technology. So in today's presentation, Jake is going to share uh, some more details with us about his efforts to uh, promote growth and stress tolerance for aquaculture species. Jake, go ahead. All right. Thanks, John. Um, I have a decent amount of slides to uh, work here, through here. so. I'm going to more or less jump right in as soon as um, these are up. Uh, but let me just start by introducing this project a little bit. There we go. Um, so we've been developing Kosajaba oil for several years now. And um, this was actually a spin out of the um, Animal Sciences Department Animal Bioproducts Initiative here at UW, and I should mention that Mark Cook, uh, I think it was six months to about a year ago, um, he gave an Ag Innovations webinar uh, where a lot of the details were focused on this bioproducts initiative, so I would encourage anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about um, that initiative to check out his webinar, and you can see a few more examples of projects that have uh, come from that. Uh, so. We, we started by developing Kosajaba oil as a anti-inflammatory, and now we're at a point where within the last couple of years, we've been co-developing the oil as a uh, beneficial feed ingredient within aquaculture, and that's through collaboration with the Aquaculture Research Lab in the Animal Science Department here on campus. So let me just introduce the team quickly. Uh, Professor Mark Cook is in the Animal Sciences Department. He's founded several companies, uh, very entrepreneurial. Uh, he took the lead on developing a uh, technology transfer platform here on campus called Discovery to Product that we uh, have been working back and forth with on this particular project. And he was my PhD mentor for the last uh, five years, and I'm now a postdoc in his lab. Uh, next is Dr. Terrence Berry. He's a senior scientist and the director of the UW Aquaculture Research Lab. He's also a very entrepreneurial guy. Uh, he's played around with his own fish farm for several years, and uh, he brings decades of aquaculture experience to our team. We also have several undergraduates and postgraduate researchers on the project. Um, in general, this project's brought about several training opportunities and um, focused in animal husbandry and lipid analytics. So uh, this has been a pretty fun project for, I think, everyone involved. So the, a brief outline for today. Um, I'm going to go
go over a little bit of the current state of global aquaculture for those who may not be familiar. Some of the production issues around uh, our focused uh, market right now, which is Atlantic salmon. A little bit more about Kosajaba oil as a feed ingredient, some efficacy studies, um, and some benefits for salmon, and, and some steps in our technology transfer process. So aquaculture globally is on the rise. Um, there's no doubt about it. The world population is increasing, and with that, a global demand for dietary protein is also increasing. Aquaculture is expected to fill this supply-demand gap, and one of the major reasons for that is uh, wild-caught fish production has been pretty much capped off and stagnant for the last 40 years. Um, so in order for uh, aquaculture to meet the protein demand, um, aquaculture has to grow, and that seems to be exactly what's happening. If we were to compare aquaculture versus terrestrial animal production, um, aquaculture tends to win out in several of the um, several major categories. Uh, one interesting thing that's not on this table as well is aquaculture actually uh, fish use less water per kilogram of edible meat than any terrestrial animal. So that's kind of one of those, those interesting little details that I didn't realize. Um, looking into Atlantic salmon a little bit, salmon are in the same family as rainbow trout. It's a very popular food um, touted for lots of health benefits. And roughly 70% of Atlantic salmon production is currently farmed. Uh, if we were to compare Atlantic salmon production volume among the other major commercial um, fish farming applications, uh, Atlantic salmon is just behind tilapia and Alaskan pollock, and as I mentioned, the majority of Atlantic salmon is farmed. Figure on the right, um, the industrialization level of Atlantic salmon is very high, which also corresponds to a very low level of investment risk. And uh, the major um, reason for a lot of this is Atlantic salmon, for one, the rearing and processing and, and live fish transport, a lot of uh, those processes are now mechanized. So Atlantic salmon represents a pretty uh, high level of technology use uh, compared to the other commercial species, but it is not without its issues. And so today I'm going to introduce one of the primary issues of Atlantic salmon production, and that is uh, this issue of seawater mortality. So on this uh, figure of life stages, if we start with eggs, salmon uh, are reared to this par stage if we go clockwise around the figure, and that's a completely freshwater stage uh, of, of their life cycle. So, so that's about a year into the production life, um, and at, at that point, par go through a natural process called smoltification, and that's, that's by natural design to allow the salmon to be adapted to growth at sea. Um, and so in a wild salmon, they would, they would be raised uh, or they would grow in fresh water and then they would make their way to the sea and uh, continue their growth at sea. In terms of commercial production, they're just physically transported to sea after um, the smoltification takes place. So the real issue though here is that once salmon are transported to sea, on average, about 10% of those salmon will die. And the major kind of causal link seems to be opportunistic infection. So if we were to look at Norway, which is the number one Atlantic salmon producing country, um, the mortality losses for the, them equals about $250 million per year. Well, diving into this a little deeper, what we um, are, are understanding more and more is that fish, uh, are they encounter a variety of stressors in their everyday life. And I, I, I think even people underestimate or uh, don't realize just how many stressors fish encounter. 
Um, so I, I'm going to focus on a few of these stressors today, but uh, it's kind of this general idea that we think stress is playing a very, very large role in the overall uh, mortality and, and the opportunistic infection that's taking place when salmon go to sea. Uh, so, getting at this idea of, okay, if fish are, um, if salmon are smolted and then go to seawater, you know, when is this time of stress occurring or when are fish most vulnerable to the opportunistic infection? And uh, so, I, I, I looked at a study here, this is from 2016, and this was interesting. Um, this particular study compared salmon transferred to seawater um, they looked at a, they basically did a disease challenge with uh, salmonid alpha virus, and that's known to cause uh, uh, pancreatic disease in salmon. And so what they looked at was if they challenged the salmon two weeks after the seawater transfer versus nine weeks after the seawater transfer, salmon at two weeks after the transfer um, carried a higher viral load than those nine weeks after the transfer. And so on the top, um, um, headings, IM and BI. IM is an intramuscular challenge and BI is a bath immersion challenge. So they did it two different ways, saw the same thing, and this would indicate that their uh, salmon post-transfer or maybe even during the smultification phase are a little bit, you know, higher, higher susceptibility to, to opportunistic infection. Another study that recently came out that I found very interesting, um, this group looked at uh, gene expression changes in a couple of tissues in um, smolting salmon and also salmon that were recently transferred to seawater. So the figure on the left, seawater transfer one is one week after the seawater transfer they sampled. SW, SWT2 is three weeks after the transfer. And it's, so this figure on the left is a little misleading. They're showing um, global changes in, um, in gene expression, the major differentially expressed genes in head, kidney, and intestine. But really, if you dive into the data, what, what they show is that there is a overwhelming immune suppression occurring um, at several stages during the smoltification process itself and after the seawater transfer. And a lot of these changes uh, correspond to antigen presentation and inflammatory function. And so we, we found this very interesting to start to dive into this a little bit for us. Another study I want to highlight here um, that involves a little bit more into the uh, effects of stress on the salmon. This, is a, this was a study looking at the transport of different groups of salmon in Norway and Scotland um, uh, to seawater. And what this article shows is that figure on the left, they're, they're looking at the cumulative mortality several days, about a month after transport to sea. And in that top line, transport one, they had the highest mortality in that group. And if you look at the table that I, I'm showing on the right, that particular group also appears to have a what would be considered kind of a rough transport ride out to sea. And so um, there's a lot of associations out there and there's a lot of data uh, beginning to pile up on, on the effects of stress and survival and kind of this connection between stress and opportunistic infection. The final stressor that I want to highlight that's pretty specific to Atlantic salmon and other fish as well, but it, it really hits Atlantic salmon in a lot of ways, is hypoxia. And so this figure I have here, if we start from the left working to the right, um, what, what this group looked at was levels of dissolved oxygen uh, in the water corresponding to days of the year. And so the vertical blue uh, bars would, would show times of supersaturated oxygen in the water. And when you get to kind of the fall months of the year, you start to see uh, the, the yellow and red bars representing moderate to severe hypoxia. And it's known that chronic hypoxia um, can reduce immune function 
in salmon. Um, and it's actually really interesting. This group did a lot of work on this topic. And uh, you can actually see where salmon, they, they will avoid light by diving down uh, deep into the water. And once they get hit with a, even an acute wave, less than 24 hours of hypoxia, you can actually um, see the behavior of the salmon change and they'll, they'll swim up and away from that. So clearly um, a, a susceptible species to hypoxia. And so our idea here is that the salmon mortality that's observed at sea, this 10% on average, we think that could easily be a contribution of several um, acute and chronic non-lethal stressors. And so we've been looking into ways, uh, strategies to overcome this stress. So that will bring us to um, a little bit of an introduction on the uh, product itself, which is Kosajaba oil. And so let me just briefly mention that, that, as I mentioned, this is part of the Animal Sciences Bioproducts Initiative. And what we're really after here is we know there are about 50 billion pounds of animal byproducts produced each year that are of low value or even waste. Um, and so what we're trying to work on now is can we better utilize these byproducts? Um, and so a little bit of transition into Kosajaba oil. I think everyone has probably seen birds in the act of preening. Um, such as a duck in a pond, you can often see them pecking at their rear ends and then coating their feathers a little bit. Um, what they're doing is they're pecking at a gland called the preen gland or the uropygial gland that's located on the dorsal side of their tail. And so when they peck at the gland, oil is released, the birds coat their feathers with the oil, and uh, it's suggested that... Um, the major function is waterproofing, although several different functions of this gland, of, of the oil that's released, um, have been investigated as well. So the function is not completely understood, seems to be multifunctional, but we know there's a variety of wax ester compounds and other unique lipids that exist within this oil. Uh, so I titled this slide, Kosajaba Oil Abundantly Uncommon, and the reason I say that is because although the oil itself is unique in a variety of ways regarding its composition, it is an abundant oil in the fact that there are 9 billion broiler chickens in the U.S., all that have a uropygial gland, all that contain preen oil. Um, so we dug into the oil composition quite a bit and um, hypothesized some anti-inflammatory and anti-proliferative properties I'll be focusing on the anti-inflammatory properties. Well, let me just explain a little bit about the extraction process that we do. So a typical extraction process of ours consists of taking the raw material, um, crudely grinding it to a specific particle size, and then uh, mechanically um, separating the wax from the protein and uh, uh, purifying out a crude oil product. So you can see kind of the uh, process flow here. Some of the benefits of Kosajaba oil as a specifically a dietary feed ingredient, we've done several oxidation studies on the oil um, that show it has very high oxidative stability versus other commonly used vegetable oils. Uh, it importantly meets several definitions, um, AFCO definitions, which are important uh, regulatory um, marks to meet if you're going to try to incorporate a uh, animal byproduct ingredient into animal feeds. The other really nice advantage of using an oil like this is that we can uh, formulate diets pre-pellet. Um, so that's, that becomes really important when you're trying to introduce a new feed ingredient into a feed manufacturer's process. Uh, you definitely don't want to try to um, introduce something post-pellet. Um, way easier if you can do it pre-pellet. It's much less disruptive to, the, to the, the feed manufacturer process. Also, in our studies so far, we've seen good palatability and very... Um, little changes as far as omega-3 washout in the uh, fillets and, and, and 
so far no adverse effects on fat deposition or body condition at all. So I will now get into a little bit of the data that we've, we've been generating over the last, I'd say, year and a half or so. And that's going to start with um, our original study uh, determining whether or not Kosajiba uh, oil would be anti-inflammatory in the diet of what we started with was arthritic mice because we have a model of chronic inflammation. In this case, it's called the collagen-induced arthritis model. It's actually an autoimmune disease of rheumatoid arthritis that we can model in mice. And so this provides us a nice model to screen anti-inflammatory compounds. And so uh, bottom left figure, what we, what we saw was after incorporating Kosajiba oil versus canola oil into the diets of arthritic mice, we assessed their arthritic severity over a nine-week period. And what we saw was that Kosajiba oil significantly decreased the arthritic score and the arthritic severity throughout that nine-week period. And we ended up looking into some of the um, uh, inflammatory markers that may be mediating this effect and saw that Kosajiba oil was decreasing two very specific pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1-beta and IL-6. Fish have these uh, same um, inflammatory mediators, although I should mention they're a little bit less, um, the assays for detecting these are a little bit less developed in fish, particularly salmon. Um, most, most of the studies are done with gene expression, so we've talked about maybe uh, developing some immune assays to, to better understand and better screen some of these anti-inflammatories. And so what I'm not showing here is a, what, when we fed just our control mice, non-arthritic mice, the Kosajiba oil, we actually saw about a 30% growth increase in those mice over mice-fed canola oil. And so that got us really interested in, okay, do we have a general growth promoter or a feed efficiency um, promoter? And we, we began looking into fish. And uh, so the aquaculture research lab, uh, we started investigating some project ideas with Dr. Barry. And um, this, this building I have circled on the image on the left, that is the water science and engineering building that sh uh, houses the aquaculture research lab. And so uh, it's a 1,200 square foot um, aquaculture lab. And uh, Dr. Barry has raised everything from salmon to trout to walleye, perch, tilapia, catfish. So several, several um, aquaculture species have been uh, uh, raised at this facility. And we, we tend to run a very customizable um, type of lab operation. So we can, we can really cater our um, experimental designs uh, in a lot of ways. So there's a lot of flexibility at this lab. And our, our first question with Kosajiba oil was, can we increase growth and feed efficiency of fish. Um, so we wanted to start with some pilot trials and these involve little fathead minnows. They're very inexpensive and very easy to raise. I think they are related to carp maybe. Um, but what we did was we incorporated Kosajiba oil, similarly like with what we did uh, with the arthritic mice, we incorporated the oil into the diet and also a control diet and fed the minnows uh, from a larval stage uh, for about two months. And after that two month grow out, we saw about a 25% increase in growth in those fish. The other thing we noticed was we actually assessed the long-term survival of the minnows. And we noticed that um, while it wasn't really the initial intent of our studies, we noticed that those fed Kosajiba actually had um, substantially increased survival over the controls. And in general, the survival was a little poor for this study because we were uh, messing around with the dietary regimen a little bit. Um, but as a second little side project that we thought would be kind of fun in the lab, we had some um, yellow cichlids that were, were being raised. And we thought, since we have the fish and we're doing some pilot studies, why don't we just start feeding these guys a little bit and uh, assess some growth. And so we started this trial very similar um, as the fathead minnow trial for collecting pilot data. 
And unfortunately, what happened by accident is these fish were subjected to a pretty substantial cold stress. And when that happened, those fed Kosajiba survived substantially better than those uh, who were not fed Kosajiba. And as you can see, after the cold stress, zero survival in those fed a control diet. So this got us pretty excited, and we decided, okay, let's uh, ask for a little bit of money and see if we can't um, start assessing the effects of Kosajiba in some... Uh, more commercially relevant aquaculture species. So we started here with walleye, and the uh, figure on the left, what we did, we, we incorporated Kosajiba and also an isocaloric fat into um, the walleye diets, um, basically to show that it wasn't just the addition of extra energy into the diet that was uh, providing these benefits to the fish. And so we assessed... Uh, that feeding, the effects of feeding over uh, roughly 90 days. And over that 90 day period, we saw an increase of about 30% in our Kosajiba group over both the controls. Um, so, figure on the right, we ended up uh, assessing survival once again. And as part of us being hit with somewhat of a series of unfortunate events here, by accident, the water was turned off to the walleye tanks, or it, it, it ran dry. And um, so, so we had a, a pretty good incidence of mortality in these fish. However, once again, what we saw was those fed the Kosajiba diet, that's the CO, um, had substantially increased survival over both of the controls. So we wanted to... Uh, you know, further investigate a little bit of the stress tolerance effects going on here. So we actually set up a, um, a legitimate trial where we, we wanted to really look into um, some of the effects of, of Kosajiba on hypoxia. So we dropped uh, the dissolved oxygen level in a um, controlled manner for these walleye on different diets. And what we saw was that the Kosajiba fed walleye actually had a 25% increase in tolerance over the controls. It, going along in parallel with these uh, walleye trials, we were also looking into rainbow trout. So we wanted to hit um, a Wisconsin relevant fish and a U.S. relevant fish, uh, rainbow trout being the U.S. relevant fish. And so we thought, well, we're getting great growth effects in walleye. Let's try this in rainbow trout. And needless to say, we designed a nice dose-response dose study and saw zero growth effects in trout. But we weren't super discouraged, and we thought, well, maybe the stress tolerance effects are independent of the growth. And so we decided to once again look at a hypoxia type of um, challenge in the rainbow trout fed Kosajiba, or in this case, it was a fish oil control diet. And once again, what we saw was a 20% increase in tolerance compared to the fish oil. Finally, what we did with the rainbow trout, uh, we were starting to get some ideas of leaning towards Atlantic salmon, and knowing that rainbow trout are in the same family as Atlantic salmon, we wanted to get some ideas as to whether or not um, Kosajiba oil could influence the uh, adaptability of trout to um, seawater. And so uh, what we ended up doing here was taking three different groups of, of trout on diet, um, those, those that were fed for one week and then transferred to seawater, those that were fed for three and then five weeks and then transferred to seawater. And what we assessed was their osmoregulatory function um, post seawater transfer. And so what we saw was that after about five weeks of uh, rainbow trout on the Kosajiba diet, we started to see an increase in the osmoregulatory function of the rainbow trout. And that's um, um, illustrated in both of these figures. So, so both of these figures very much mimic each other and mirror each other because they're really two measures of the same thing. On the left, we have plasma chloride ion concentration. So basically, if a fish is in seawater and not 
regulate, not regulating the plasma ions very well, um, the plasma ions will therefore increase and you have a stressed fish who is not tolerating seawater very well. Figure on the right is a very similar thing. Um, it's just a measure that is based off of the vapor pressure of uh, plasma. So now uh, we're going to get into a little bit of um, why we think and where we are now with Atlantic salmon and really why we think that Kosajiba oil is a good fit for Atlantic salmon. <clears throat> so this, this table really just uh, reiterates a lot of what I already talked about. We've seen a lot of um, effects of Kosajiba, particularly on the seawater stress, hypoxia stress, and temperature stress all of which uh, I mentioned are um, very relevant stressors for Atlantic salmon. Uh, what we're now investigating is uh, the effects of Kosajiba on transport stress and pathogen stress. And overall, we, we, we think we might have a very practical, effective um, solution for some of these um, acute and chronic multi-hit stressors that seem to be uh, leading to opportunistic infection in Atlantic salmon. And some of these trials, we're, we're just starting some trials with Atlantic salmon right now. And uh, those are in collaboration with a, a group called uh, Superior Fresh, that's a startup company in Wisconsin. And what they're doing is raising uh, Atlantic salmon completely on land-based recirculation systems. And that's, that's part of a, I think they're the first um, largest aquaponics facility in the US. And so we, we took a trip out there and visited them. Very exciting place. So let me just speak to the financial analysis for Atlantic salmon a little bit. Um, essentially, the number of fish deaths per year for the Norwegian Atlantic salmon production is about 27 million fish per year die during the seawater transfer phase. <clears throat> so Based on our data, if we can save 30% of those fish, that would translate to a $73 million per year value to the Atlantic salmon industry. We know based on the supply of the raw materials and the level uh, that we're feeding Kosajiba in the diet that we can actually meet 100% of the Norwegian Atlantic salmon market need. And so uh, we're, we're really focusing on the Norwegian Atlantic salmon market right now as kind of the first stop of um, application for Kosajiba oil. A little bit of work in progress here. We still need to refine a, our dose response, um, basically minimize the, the amount of Kosajiba in the diet to uh, maximize the benefits. And a little bit of work still on the length of feeding requirements. We actually think that uh, it's possible to strategically apply Kosajiba oil in the diets of salmon and other fish around anticipated times of stress. And so we're kind of investigating whether or not that's uh, a good idea or not. And finally, I'll wrap up with just some of the next steps in our um, development process. We'd like to keep working on our uh, oil extraction and processing methods trying to work towards a cost of goods sold. Um, as I mentioned, uh, dose response uh, is still being investigated. Um, we, we're really trying to dig in more into the mechanism of action here. And also, we'd like to evaluate some other markets where CO um, Kosajiba oil may provide benefits. And that could be outside of aquaculture. Uh, we've talked about looking into human supplements, things like that. Um, but so far, we are very much focused on the Atlantic salmon market. And our goal here is to work towards some efficacy trials, um, particularly in-house in some uh, Norwegian Atlantic salmon production facilities. And uh, as part of the iterative process of developing this oil, we are going to continue to keep refining the economic viability. And so that will do it for me. Um, I provided my email address. Please uh, let me know if you have any questions around any of the content that I talked about today. And uh, thank you for your time. Jake, thank you for that. So I just uh, changed the screen format a little bit so we can see the questions a little bit more clearly. So 
Um, as your questions come up, please uh, type them in the chat box below. And it looks like we've already got a, got a couple of questions. So uh, first from John, and I, I think this came up when it uh, when you were showing some of the statistics, but he's asking about catfish. And so uh, I don't know if you're able to do this, but are you able to speak a little bit from uh, that earlier slide where uh, Atlantic salmon production uh, relates relative to catfish? I think that's what John was uh, trying to get at. Yeah, so um, I'm not super familiar with catfish. That would be a great question for Terry. Um, I know it's big in the U.S., particularly the southern U.S. I don't, I'm not familiar with their, the, the, I know they, they have some disease issues, but I'm not incredibly familiar um, with, with their production process. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, we, absolutely, we are open to considering all sorts of different um, species. It's it, it's kind of a question of the economics around that. Sure. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. So the next question is from uh, Christopher, and uh, looks like he's asking about uh, kusajaba oil um, applications to other uh, to species other than uh, other than fish. So, for example, livestock, um, other kinds of uh, animal production. So uh, I know you talked about mice a little bit. Other uh, other kinds of ideas. Yeah, we've been kicking around a few ideas of um, other applications uh, beyond fish. Um, so one, one issue I think that we're going to run into if we decide to uh, start start feeding larger animals is their, their dietary requirement, the amount of diet that an individual animal needs, particularly when their feed conversion, such as um, in cattle, is is really poor, uh, I think we're going to hit a limit where we aren't going to be able to provide enough of the Kosajiba oil to meet a um, application like that. And I could be wrong, and it would absolutely depend on the dose, but um, we, we are considering some of those applications. Uh, it just, uh, we, we, I guess we were, we were really excited by kind of the um, current trends in aquaculture and uh, the need for something like this, a very clear need for something like this in aquaculture. So we focused, we focused there first. Okay, thanks for that. So uh, next question from uh, uh, John Trotta. Um, can you talk a little bit more about progress on applications to uh, other species not related to salmon? So maybe uh, the, the walleye or some of the other uh, 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 related species you were talking about. Where, where do you guys stand there? Yeah, so we 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 uh, have performed a few trials now in um, well, so yellow perch and walleye. Um, I think I think that's that's it as far as some other commercially relevant species are concerned. Um, and it seems uh, I, I, it's kind of a variable effect in these fish right now. We're still trying to determine really what it is about Kosajaba that seems to provide benefits to the Salmonids, but not necessarily, or I guess I should say inconsistently, to um, I, like the Persiforms and, and, and other fish, you know, not related to the Salmonids. So uh, we're, we're trying to understand that um, there seems to be just some, you know, like perch just seem to be an incredibly unique fish, kind of all their own. Um, but we, I know we are interested still in following up with the walleye as well. But um, yeah, I guess I guess once once we kind of started to figure out um, really the the need for a stress uh, tolerance promoting um, add, feed additive for salmon, we got uh, really involved in that. And I guess it's kind of less clear maybe how it would benefit um, some of these other species. Particularly the survival, the value of survival in a um, species like salmon or even rainbow trout absolutely outweighs the value of growth um, for a variety of reasons uh, uh, for, that, for those sorts of applications. And a lot of it has to do with just the, the amount of oil we have to provide in the diet.
Okay, thanks for that. Um, so uh, next question from Julia, and I'm going to combine a couple of these uh, uh, also with sure. uh, Randy's question and then her, her second question. So um, I'm going to just hit them all at once and we can kind of combine, you can combine these into a single response. But so how soon will producers be able to get um, the uh, supplement in the U.S.? Um, and can you talk a little bit about the current challenges you are facing before its release? Um, maybe more broadly, the uh, other commercial availability. So you're talking about with uh, with the Norway producers. So maybe distinguish between Norway and the U.S. Um, and then finally, the cost. How much might it, is this product going to cost? Uh, maybe at Norway and uh, uh, for U.S. producers. So yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as far as uh, the commercial availability, um, we're a little bit early in our in our transfer process right now. We're still uh, wrapping up some efficacy studies, and so I I don't think uh, so. We're having some conversations right now with no Norwegians, but I don't think we're going to be able to get anything over there for trialing until we can really really lock in our efficacy data with salmon uh, that we're, we're working on at, at UW here. Um, challenges, uh, so some of the major challenges we're, we're going to be facing here right now are, um, for one, I, I, I think just the um, kind of the business model side of this is how do we, you know, um, arrange kind of our supplier agreements, how do we get our uh, product transported um, in a, a cost-efficient way to Norway, right? So some of the challenges I think are going to be just, just the practical uh, implementation of this, of this product, particularly in a market where, you know, we aren't, we aren't housed, right? So, um, it's kind of, I guess, one of our biggest challenges is trying to meet, uh, trying to get some connections um, for, uh, for, uh, yeah, developing our back and forth with Norway a little bit, and we've started to do that, but that I see that as being a pretty slow process. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so uh, the next question. Um, let me scroll down. So, what are the predominant fatty acids uh, in the uh, uh, boy? I'm having a hard time today. Uh, the Kasajaba oil. Yeah, yeah, it's a fun one to say. Um, yeah, but, uh, let, let me mention Co Kasajaba. It you know it sounds like you know some exotic oil, but it, it's it's kind of just a mashup of um, a lot of our names. That there were four particular co-inventors on this product, and so we. We basically just scrambled some of our <laughs> some of the letters in our name uh, together and came up with Kosajiba, and it turns out it's yeah kind of a mouthful to say. So no, understandable. Um, as far as the the fatty acid composition goes, um, it's pretty unique for uh, for preen oil and Kosajiba oil, and what we see a lot of are a high degree of saturated fats um, compared to say. Uh, like fish oil, um, you know, almost completely 180 degree different fatty acid profiles. So, uh, Kosajiba would be pretty low in omega threes, pretty high in um, certain saturated fats. It also has a um, considerable level of linoleic acid compared to, say, fish oil. But a lot of the research right now is starting to show that um, increasing the linoleic acid in, in uh, fish diets may actually be beneficial as well. So, um, pretty unique composition, though. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so, uh, so this is related maybe to the question that I hit. Uh, we talked about a little bit earlier, but uh, maybe talk a little bit about potential applications to the uh, ornamental fish industry. Looks like you may have uh, some applications there. Yeah, and we've. I mean, we've really considered. Um, like I said, we've, we've been developing this for several years now, and we, we absolutely started considering uh, some applications into the ornamentals as well. Um, I, I think for us, uh, as far as the, the volume of, 
I guess what it comes down to for us right now is the, the fit with Atlantic Salmon is just, it seems to be really, really nice. And um, so we're kind of at a place where we have a production volume of oil that can fit the um, salmon market really nicely. I think, you know, I, don't, I guess I don't have the numbers on the ornamentals, um, but it's not necessarily clear to me, um, you know, how, how much benefit we could provide ornamentals. Um, I, I guess I'm not sure as far as the major problems that or ornamental fish uh, are faced. I, you know, for, for all I know, it's typically ammonia problems, overfeeding, um, lack of tank cleanings, things like that. And I, I don't think that we're going to have um, necessarily effects on, uh, you know, ammonia tolerance or toxin tolerance and things like that in water. Um, but, I, you know, I'm, I could be uh, missing a few things here in that, in that industry. So happy to discuss it, absolutely. Um, but, yeah, we, we, we have considered it, just not necessarily a, a major focus right now. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so from uh, Julie again, it looks like she wants just a little bit more clarification on costs for a producer, even if you're just give, able to maybe give a, uh, an idea. So let's say maybe a ballpark uh, cost per, per fish or something like that. Any, any ideas? Um, yeah, let's see. So yeah, that's a little tricky right now. I, I mean, so the problem right now that we're, we're before, you know, if I started throwing out numbers, the problem we're going to have is um, we're still refining our dose and we're still refining our, uh, the length of time that fish need to uh, have Kosajiba oil incorporated into their diet. Um, but, you know, I would say if you can send me an email, I can probably give you a ballpark range. Uh, it's just going to, it will take me kind of a few minutes to work some of our assumptions um, into a little bit of a value model for that. Um, I just, I, I have those numbers, I just don't have them right in front of me. And it's, it's a, a, a fairly decent range, I would say, just because of our, uh, where we're at right now in the development process. Okay, cool. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so I've just got one question for you, um, and then we'll uh, mm -hmm. wrap this up. Um, so you you hinted or you talked a little bit about some other uh, animal byproducts. Um, with regard to uh, aquaculture, can you give us, without revealing any sort of uh, IP uh, challenges or anything like that, can you give us a hint of some of the other things that uh, innovations your group might be working on right now without, uh, again, without spoiling uh, uh, any kinds of uh, issues around the uh, IP? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so the uh, Bioproducts Initiative, um, it, you know, it, it really does. What, what we're after is is any any byproduct that could be of potential value, and it's it's we start with um, looking at the commercial viability of a potential product and. Uh, and, and it has to be backed by science. So we don't, we don't really even begin to develop anything until we have a literature-backed hypothesis as to why a byproduct might have any type of um, bioactivity for a given application. And so some of the things that we've been investigating here, so this was a lipids project. We've also investigated some, um, some bioactive proteins as well. Um, we, we're, we're looking into a, a couple of other lipids um, that are of um, novel function, we believe. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, typically what we're doing is, you know, we're looking at what, what's being thrown out. What are, what are the volumes of, of products being thrown out? And is there any novelty to those products? Or can we crudely extract something that might have some bioactivity? And, uh, and so I guess an example would be, you know, we've worked on a couple of protein products. And as I mentioned in the, uh, a couple slides ago in the feed manufacturing process, we, we found some protein products that absolutely had some bioactivity. But as soon as you incorporate them pre-pellet into a diet, the heat, the pelleting process introduces lots of heat. And all of a sudden, you've got denatured proteins. And 
now your bioactivity is is completely sunk. So um, you know, yeah, we, we we're exploring lots of different uh, 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 potential products. Um, so we we you know are yeah we're 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 definitely still kind of figuring out what are the types of bioproducts that lend themselves well to uh, commercial um, um, application and things like that. But, uh, you know, yeah, I guess we're, we're still uh, uh, a little bit new into some of this. So it's, it's, it's been interesting, and we've been um, learning a lot, of, a lot of lessons as far as the development process goes. OK, thanks for that. Looks like we got uh, uh, another question, um, and this is from John. And so, do you think it is the tag composition or other component that is responsible for the effect that you've seen? So you have to describe what tag is. Yeah. So, ta so uh, I think the questions regarding um, triacylglyceride composition, um, and yeah, I mean, we're we're looking into some of these things. It's it's. Uh, I guess one of the problems we're having right now is, um, you know, salmon take a considerably long time to raise, and so we're we're really trying to figure out a nice bioassay to start to understand some of the active components of Kosajiba. Um It could be a multitude of things, and we we have to. I mean, if you were to dig into the literature on um, on prenoil itself, I mean, there, it's it's full of lipid compounds. All of you know, many many of which could have uh, or or be eliciting anti inflammatory It's almost like um, you know, what are the benefits of dairy fat, right? There's just there's so many different compounds that could be interacting and at play here. Um, so yeah, we're trying to work on that. Our problem right now is we we need to develop a nice bioassay, and as I mentioned, the um, immune assays for fish are um, lacking. And so we have uh, a few hurdles to overcome if we're going to really, really investigate an active ingredient here. OK, Jake, thank you for that. Um, so it looks like we may get one other question, or at least a comment. So um, before uh, that pops up, uh, do you have any, uh, any parting thoughts, any uh, last comments you want to leave the audience with? Um, I, no, I mean, I, I guess my, my, my parting comments would be, um, uh, kind of related to what I mentioned with the, uh, the development that I think needs to take place as far as if we're really going to start to understand, um, the effects of, of acute and chronic stress on the survival of, of fish. I mean, you, you saw kind of the, economic impact that this um, mortality issue uh, brings to the table. And I, I just, I guess I feel like there's a pretty underdeveloped um, array of assays and tools to begin to, to kind of tease a lot of the um, effects of these stressors on immune function and, and things like that out. I, I see tons of studies on gene expression, but we've seen um, in mice and other animals where you know, you can have upregulated genes that do not, or, or downregulated genes that do not translate to a protein difference or um, a functional difference. And so I guess for me, it's, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to try to start getting together um, uh, uh, some collaborations to try to develop some uh, tools to actually go in and assess uh, immune function and inflammatory function as it relates to some of these stressors. So that, that would be my, my kind of parting thoughts. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. Um, and uh, again, if you'd like a copy of the recording, so I've got our uh, YouTube page address um, posted in the uh, chat box so you can scroll and uh, get access to that. Um, and also, uh, uh, this uh, we, I'll leave this uh, presentation up for a bit so you can get uh, Jake's uh, email if you'd like that, but also my email and a uh, LinkedIn address is in the uh, uh, in the chat box. So again, uh, thank you in the audience for participating, and I want to say thank you to our presenter, Jake Olson from the University of Wisconsin. Thanks again, and uh, that wraps up our webinar.